Thank you so much for uh, joining us on a Friday after the long week of uh, workshop setting. So could I request everyone to just uh, move up a few seats forward because we are a small group and it might be easier to have a discussion if we are all sitting uh, closer together. So today we are here where we want to look at like one of the critical concerns that's been bothering so many of us over the years, which is the fact that uh, sexism and misogyny are becoming distressingly common in online interactions, whether it's the intimate private encounters or it's simple social interactions online or it is public encounters on the internet. And we see that there is a proliferation of speech and forms of expression that spreads, incites, promotes, or justifies hatred based on sex. And of course, this hate speech against women and girls, this is also entangled with race, caste, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and other identity-based markers, and this is really uh, worrisome. So now we recognize that when we came together to do this discussion, that there is a continuum of cyber violence and sexist hate speech is a part of that. And we want to focus on this issue. And we also understand that what makes this issue particularly complicated is that in online spaces, when the line between speech and action blurs, and also the line between speech and representation blurs. How do you look at what is sexist hate speech and what may be another form of violence which may need a different response, for example? That becomes a tough. And this is, this is also part of the issue we want to dwell upon. So in this discussion, we are looking at broadly three broad questions, though I would like to underscore the point that we recognize that first this is about culture and we have to change the uh, cultural context so that sexism and misogyny are not seen as normal and acceptable. But today we are looking at three broad questions. In one is the question of legal response to see whether national laws address this issue adequately and if not, what else needs to change. The second is the issue of internet intermediary policies and what can change and what can be done better. And the third is the very problematic issue that has come up right now on which there is no real agreement of what is the role of automated tools in addressing this issue in online environments. How do we see the role of automated tools and uh, algorithms uh, in this context? And with me, I would just like to, for the discussion, we have four panelists with us. So on my right is uh, Mariana, and we begin with her. So Mariana is the director of Internet Lab, a think tank based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, working on the intersection of human rights and technology. She's a lawyer, and she holds a PhD in the sociology of law from the University of Sao Paulo, and has been working on issues around gender and technology and information policies. And now we'll hear from Mariana her take on the issue. Can I ask you to please put up, yes, there it is. So good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd really like to thank you for being here. I'm aware that Friday morning is not the best of times after a full IGF. Um, so what I'm going to speak about a little bit here uh, is, of course, hate speech against women in Brazil, but from the perspective of a research that we at Internet Lab are starting developing with IT for Change uh, from India. Um, and this uh, is a research that uh, we started in August. It's going to last two years, and it comprises many different phases. But we already started uh, a part of it, and there's some results that are really interesting to share. Um, and some of what I'm going to speak uh, refers to, to what we've been doing there together. I guess the first thing I think it's important to say here is that naming has a role when we're speaking about violence, right? And over the years when working with online violence against women, 
we've come up with a taxonomy of uh, forms of violence. Um, different organizations around the world are doing that. Uh, civil society organization, organization, state organizations. Um, and that has been important to differentiate uh, forms of violence that are happening online, and that has a role not only for science and discussion, but it's become clear over the years that in a symbolic way, uh, it has uh, a role, but it also has a role in making something visible and uh, bringing the pro problem forth and, and helping victims recognize a problem, but also in unleashing uh, policy responses, right? And uh, I'm, I guess I'm saying that because when we started this project about hate speech against women, one of the issues was exactly that. What is hate speech against women? Why do we need to speak about hate speech against women? And what's the problem in not necessarily having a very clear definition uh, or knowing the boundaries of that is uh, or being able to convey something when we speak of hate speech, right? And then when we're speaking of hate speech in our countries, of course, we all always have to refer to that uh, in a particular cultural and political context. And because we're doing a research in India and in Brazil, of course, we're referring to our own contexts. And when I'm speaking of mine, I'm speaking of a country in which there's a huge conservative backlash at this moment, something that's been happening in many different countries, I guess. Uh, it's a conservative backlash after years of a rising feminism in the public sphere that was very well noticed. But at the same time, this is not just a cultural backlash, let's say it. It's also very clearly a political backlash. Um, and when I'm saying political backlash, referring to hate speech or misogyny in general, um, I'm saying that because we elected a president last year who is vocally a misogynist. He, he has been uh, publicly a misogynist. So one of the things that actually happened right before he was elected was a conflict he had with a congresswoman. That's Maria do Rosario. Uh, she's a congresswoman who was discussing a bill around rape. And in the middle of the discussion, he just said to her, that she did not have to worry about being raped because she was not beautiful enough to be raped. So she was not even worthy of being raped. And that is the person that was elected uh, in Brazil last year. So of course, that leads to a huge normalization of hate speech. I'm not just saying that this person is responsible. Of course, I think the very election of this person uh, reflects something. But of course, when you have people ruling, that um, are normalizing this discourse, this, be this becomes uh, normal discourse uh, every time more. And we really want to look into that normalization. That's part of what we want to do in this project. We feel that um, hate speech against women is something that's becoming more and more accepted in some societies. And it's really a question why that is and how do you counter that, right? And Nandini was saying, well, of course, there's a cultural aspect to this, but what we're looking into in this first phase is the legal framework and trying to understand how the existence or not of a legal framework around hate speech against women um, relates to that culture, right? And so this is what we're doing right now. What we started doing uh, is looking into how does the law respond to the issue of hate speech against women in particular. And in Brazil, what we're seeing is that there's no particular framework, although of course some instruments in law can be used uh, to legally combat, right, to, to be able, for women to be able to prosecute uh, against uh, particular stances of hate speech, but there's no clear definition of what hate speech is, and there's no clear definition even in political, in public discussion. And we have a hypothesis for that. Uh, we really think that hate is in a native category in Brazil. This is something that started appearing in one uh, legal decision or another from the year 2000 on. Uh, that was not used in the legal framework. And the hypothesis we have is that this is being brought into the legal discussion 
because of the internet and because of platforms and how they refer to the problem. But when you look at the, polit and the, at the public discussion before, of course, we were discussing sexism, misogyny, and also other forms of hate, right? We we're, were talking of racism, of LGBT phobia, but we weren't using the word hate. And that also adds to the problem, because since this is not a native category and it's not in our law or in our legal doctrine, it gets even harder to know what the boundaries are. And then when we're looking at the court rulings, which was what we're starting to do now to see, okay, if we don't have a proper framework, if this is not uh, clear in law, how do cases that we could refer as being hate speech against women uh, arrive in the courts and how are they dealt with? And so we started to do a research in our national databases and that's what we're doing right now, right? Eloise is sitting right there, she's collaborating with the research. Um, and it's hard even to find the cases because of the lack of a legal framework and then the absence of particular words that you can use to look up for the rulings, right? Like, which words do you use to find decisions uh, that refer to women prosecuting because of uh, having been met with hate, right? Uh, so we tried different things. We tried broader uh, keywords, research keywords, to, and then we got like many, many, many decisions and we're manually looking into them to see what appears, but then also when we use the most specific keywords, so for example, misogyny or hate, one of the things we realize is that just one or two decisions appear in each court, and these are really recent decisions which are very clearly um, already uh, in a dialogue with the public discussion going on. But when you look for other words, for example, like feminism, which we thought it was something that could like bring a discussion because of the way that uh, people frame the problems, we found something very curious, that the cases in which the word feminism appeared were cases actually of men bringing lawsuits against women uh, for defamation because they had been called sexists. And we found many of those decisions. Uh, and upon found, finding that, we were really uh, drawn into thinking that um, it's interesting how even if we would use the words that we would expect women to be using uh, to refer to the, the sexism, sexism they're going through, in the public sphere we see men prosecuting, right? And this has been leading us to think that um, there's even a problem of women being considered worthy of uh, bringing a lawsuit or of even being defamated, right? Because it's very clear that men are, fe are feeling um, more um, incentivized somehow to, to come to courts and complain about women. And then the second thing that's become pretty clear is that even when we see lawsuits referring to situations which we would define as hate speech against women, they're not, never framed as that. Uh, it's very uncommon that something brings framed as hate speech against a woman or misogyny or sexist speech. Uh, because we have other laws that protect other characteristics, so for example an anti-racist law or a recent uh, Supreme Court decision against LGBT phobia and declaring that LGBT phobia is a crime just as racist speech is. Um, you see some cases arriving in court in which you see an intersectional slur, for example, something that refers to a woman's um, race, but also to an aspect of her gender. But this is never framed in terms of gender, right? It's being very constantly framed uh, with the other social markers, but never with the gender aspect of it. So, well, we're still looking into it, and it's going to be only in the next months that we're really going to be uh, having uh, deeper results. But this already leads us to a few important questions, I think, which are about the relations between law and culture, right? If we're speaking about normalization of hate speech against women, so what's the relation of that with the absence uh, of a discussion in law? Um, 
how does those how do those things interconnect right the fact that we don't have a specific framework addressing uh, hate speech against women is that um, something that frames the issue in the public sphere and uh, in the way that people talk about the problem. And that seems to be the case, right? If you don't have even like a legal figure, a legal concept to, to uh, frame the discussion around, of course, you're going to frame it in other ways. And um, this leads us to think that perhaps it might be important to think of a legal framework. It doesn't have necessarily to be a criminal legal framework, but to think of legal concepts uh, through which uh, this discussion can also be conveyed. I think one last thing I'd like to say about the legal framework in Brazil is that it would be a lie to say that there's nothing in the law about that. Um, we have an important domestic violence law, but that doesn't address those issues specifically. But last year, a law was approved specifically mentioning the word misogyny. Uh, it's a law that's actually a procedural law. Uh, all it did was declaring that crimes that involved misogyny were going to be investigated by the federal police instead of the state police. I'm sorry, that involved misogyny online. And that was uh, enacted because of all the difficulties in doing investigations about online situations and because there had been particular situations of online trolling uh, against particular women which were, uh, didn't find, weren't met uh, with a competent investigation. But the problem about that law is that it just says that crimes involving uh, online misogyny are going to be federalized, but it doesn't define what misogyny is. And what we've found so far is that uh, it hasn't been very properly enforced also because of the lack of understanding of what is a crime involving misogyny. So that adds to the uh, question of should we go further into a legal framework and what would that bring to the public discussion. So that, those were my initial remarks. I think there are more things that uh, I'd like to, to discuss about these initial results, but I'd like to do that in the light of the presentations of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. I think uh, from uh, when you're making the entire presentation, uh, one thing that I was reminded of was something that the veteran feminist scholar Nancy Fraser has said, that if the metana narrative of what justice itself becomes unjustly framed, then how can women actually frame a claim? Right? And so if the law, there is a semantic violence where there is an erosion or an erasure of particular kinds of violence against women, then how is it that we take the feminist fight forward? So this was what struck me. And with that, I would turn it over to my colleague Bhavna, who is a, f a lawyer, and uh, she works on gender-based hate speech online issues at IT for Change. And I would like request her to share her experiences of studying this issue in the Indian context. Thank you so much, Nandini. Uh, thank you, Mariana. You've really made my job much, much easier. Uh, uh, so I really just have to just have to contextualize the same issues in uh, the Indian perspective, and uh, I don't have to spend as much time uh, explaining to you what's happening theoretically. So um, can can you have the yeah? Can we go to the first first? This is the last uh, slide. Sorry, I think it's uh, gone to the. Yeah, uh, just go to the, the last slide instead, and we'll have to go backwards, I think. It's the same presentation, just the last panel of that slide. Thank you. So uh, I'll be uh, addressing gender-based hate speech online. Uh, and uh, these are my reflections from uh, the same study that uh, we are doing in collaboration with Internet Labs Brazil in the Indian context. Um, and uh, uh, do you mind if I stand? Uh, I'll just be happier doing that. So uh, 
feminist uh, feminist digital activists uh, in the early years of the internet uh, saw great promise uh, and emancipatory potential in the internet and uh, this dream uh, of uh, you know breaking free of taboos uh, that restricted women within the four walls of their homes and communities um, within the expansive uh, potentialities of the digital society uh, really seemed to be the the thing that that drove so much of our enthusiasm in the early 2000s and uh, come uh, recent years we found that that dream has not proven to be as true as uh, you know uh, it had promised to be um, we have had the return of gender conservatism with a vengeance and uh, this uh, gender conservatism has uh, uh, made women try to adapt within the uh, uh, intimate social, uh, for example, over here, there's a girl who's uh, talking about how she has to monitor uh, the photographs that she uploads onto Facebook uh, uh, for fear of, uh, you know, uh, policing by her boyfriend or uh, um, whether it is in the public political. So um, we have voices where women feel uh, that they must, uh, uh, women find themselves attacked w within these spaces when they try to engage with larger communities on the internet. Um, so we have uh, women facing an onslaught of gender-based trolling online. This is um, also borne out by a study that id for change did, uh, where we uh, surveyed 881 young women between the ages of 18 to 19, 19 to 23, and uh, uh, they said that they had, uh, they reported that they'd, they'd faced uh, gender-based trolling uh, along the lines of skin color, weight, body shape, looks. Um, and uh, this is even further exacerbated when uh, people, when women are, uh, when women are situated within um, marginalized uh, uh, identities. So if they are from ma marginal uh, social locations, they, uh, they've had, uh, I think, very similar to the experience that Mariana shared uh, of, uh, you know, who would rape you sort of sentiments because uh, are you even good looking enough to be raped uh, since you are dark skinned? Uh, such uh, narratives uh, emerge. Um, this is something that's borne out across the world, including India. Journalists, women, politicians uh, face a higher degree of scrutiny, uh, well, higher degree of trolling um, on the grounds of gender. Even when they are being uh, criticized for their public opinions, for their political opinions, for their um, participation in scandals, even then they are called prostitutes, which is a unique terminology that is used to address uh, female journalists in India uh, because it uh, you know, captures truly the sexism within um, uh, the, within any any slur that you could use for a journalist um, and uh, uh, also attacked for having apparently Muslim husbands which is uh, uh, somehow related to her political views um, there's also the uh, dimension of hypernationalistic uh, patriarchy which presents itself uh, a also which manifests in the kind of trolling that uh, uh, happens online or even in the kinds of uh, exaltations and exhortations to um, you know, uh, to claim an appropriate uh, and colonize women's bodies, especially if these bodies are of women from uh, minority communities. Um, as in this instance, uh, in relation to Kashmiri women, um, if you're familiar with the, the change in status of Jammu and Kashmir, um, this is the kind of uh, videos that were uploaded on TikTok. Um, and uh, so all of this brings me to recognize, as we have, I think, a shared understanding in this room, that there is a normalization and naturalization of cultures of sexism and misogyny online as well. Um, and uh, law enforcement officers is, uh, equally think of, uh, think of this as a natural thing that happens, that's a normal thing that happens that women shouldn't react to. Um, and, uh, that, uh, and they bring in their family values, uh, sort of uh, orientation towards uh, uh, you know, policing women. Because uh, uh, why should why should women uh, engage in these uh, engage with these trolls? It could lead to the destruction of their families. Um, and uh, so, the only conclusion that I can come to is that this is not just trolling. This is the proliferation of misogynistic, sexist, hate speech. Um, it's silencing women. It's uh, uh, and that is the definition of what hate speech is. It is speech that silences the uh, the the class of persons that it is directed at. Um, and uh, we, have to rec we have to look into whether existing legal policy frameworks that we have within India are adequately addressing this um, proliferation. So if we evaluate the existing legal frameworks, we find that the law is silent on gender as a ground of uh, sexist hate speech. 
Um, despite having a progressive constitution, it doesn't specifically address uh, uh, gender-based hate speech as a form of reasonable restriction to freedom of speech and expression. Uh, statutory provisions uh, that prohibit hate speech express concern for public order and tranquility and not for the dignity of the individual that is being targeted. Um, victims are forced to take recourse to a patchwork of uh, legislations and uh, provisions, right? What are these legislations like? They can go to something like criminal intimidation, which requires a very high threshold of proving that the threat is, uh, you know, of such a nature that it can um, it can harm them physically, uh, potentially. And doing that of online interactions becomes quite difficult. Um, cyber stalking uh, is a provision which is a gender specific provision, but uh, it doesn't cover most forms of uh, sexist hate speech that women face online. Um, then we have another category of these Victorian legacy morality sort of laws, um, which are uh, framed under under norms like insult to modesty, which are problematic because it requires a woman to prove that she had modesty to begin with. Um, uh, so how do you really go about proving that you are, your modesty was insulted? Um, or uh, you know, digital publication uh, also has introduced, uh, so uh, Information Technology Law, um, Act has also introduced these provisions on obscene legal content. Um, so again, going back to the same framing of what is obscenity and um, in, in any case, if not all kinds of gender trolling are obscene, some of it can simply be a back to the kitchen um, sort of insult, which is not obscene, but still demeaning. Um, so we also obviously looked at defamation because it seems like an obvious place to go to when you're discussing uh, uh, you know, uh, harms to dignity, uh, harms to reputation. And uh, we found, much like Mariana did, that uh, uh, defamation uh, laws were invoked, but usually against women who were making f claims to female sexuality. For instance, this is an actress who spoke about the ubiquity of living relationships within her home state, and people in her home state thought that this was such an outrage uh, against the moral values of that state. How could she say that living relationships were common um, in that state? Uh, and that is how they thought that she was defaming the state. Um, and uh, so, the another, another place that women can go to, therefore, is maybe, since this is the online space, we can go to intermediaries and hope that platform intermediaries will solve our problems, uh, will actually take these uh, issues seriously. Um, for instance, this is a, uh, but this is the report that uh, Equality Labs came up with earlier this year, where they did a Facebook India specific study. And they found that 93% of all hate speech that are reported to Facebook don't end up being actioned. Uh, they remain on Facebook. Uh, this is the nature of uh, the content that uh, stays up. Um, another is, uh, uh, this is another one where a Dalit activist is uh, being threatened. Um, and uh, so, uh, do we have a legal framework that forces intermediaries to sort of take actions? Yes, no, kind of. The intermediary guidelines came into place in the year 2011. The intermediary guidelines created a mechanism wherein intermediaries were supposed to take down unlawful content, content that violated Indian laws, um, you know, upon actual knowledge, upon receiving actual knowledge of such violation. Now, this only meant a notice at that point of time. 2014, 2015, the Shreya Singhal uh, judgment came out, and this uh, Supreme Court decision uh, led to the reading down of the uh, actual knowledge standard to um, a court order standard. So uh, now intermediaries are only obligated to take down violating content if there is a court order that demands that they take it down, which obviously creates a much higher threshold. So every time that somebody finds themselves trolled or uh, attacked on uh, you know, any social media, they have to uh, have probably take the effort of go file an FIR, get a court order, send it to uh, the intermediary, and only then does the intermediary have a legal obligation to take it down. right? Um, uh, the government is trying to amend the intermediary guidelines currently and is probably going to come up with a new version of the intermediary guidelines in January 2020. This will include and introduce algorithmic filtering for unlawful content, which brings me to the idea of unlawful content. As I'd mentioned earlier, we need to have gender-based hate speech to be unlawful before it can be taken down, right? So even within the intermediary guidelines, there are provisions that uh, specify what is the nature of content that must be taken down by intermediaries. 
they are grossly harmful or harassing racially or ethnically objectionable disparaging defamatory obscene not sexist right that doesn't find itself in any of these terms um, and there is also provision that uh, they must take down any content that violates any law in force again there is no law that says that they must take down defamate that that you know def sexist hate speech is a problem so um, let's say we managed to get a clause introduced that makes sexist hate speech uh, you know gender based hate speech to be included as a category of unlawful content we now have to address the problem of uh, potential over censorship uh, by proactive filtering and uh, so uh, that's something that we have to really take into serious consideration as we try and create these, uh, create, find our way forward from here. Um, and I go back to the three feminist mantras of resist, remedy, and redress. Um, we can resist through the use of counter speech, feminist movement. Um, we can uh, try and, you know, uh, use movements like I am here, uh, which are trying to get, uh, uh, trying to decrease the, the onslaught of uh, sexist hate speech online. Or we can uh, perhaps come up with uh, remedial measures, which can be in the nature of quasi-judicial approaches, perhaps uh, like uh, an ethics board, uh, which I think Christoph will tell us some, uh, some more about. Um, and uh, or redress, uh, which could be in the form of uh, creative use of defamation laws, wherein these laws are actually used not to, uh, you know, not as a, not, they, these laws that will not see women as uh, the insult that needs to be protected against, uh, but will uh, be able to be used by women to protect themselves from reputational harms. So that is a hope that we have, uh, that we can action, um, can, can, make, can make happen, or perhaps we can look at, as Mariana said, um, civil law remedies that, uh, that maybe uh, with their lower thresholds be a more practical way to uh, counter this sort of hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, and I think that uh, you brought out this very important point that today we are caught between uh, two Leviathans. There is the nation state and there is the platform intermediary, and both have indulged in excessive misuse of power. So in the initial days of the internet, when we would think that the internet is the stateless place and we finally have a refuge from the tyranny of the nation state, we increasingly find that that is no longer true. And this means that in struggles like the struggles against uh, sexist hate speech, how do we play between these two powers and what do we do? That becomes harder and harder. And this brings me to our third, the intervention from our third panelist, Nima Ayer who is founder and director of Policy, a civic technology organization based in Kampala, Uganda. Policy uses data, design, and technology to improve how citizens and governments engage around public service delivery. Nima currently leads the design of a number of projects focused on building data skills, on fostering conversations on data privacy and security. And in particular, Nima, I think that it would be great to have your reflections on after hearing these two presentations from your own work in the African region, if, if what is the risk that we find ourselves in if we are trying to seek legal remedies for hate speech and intervention from the state? And also when we look at dealing with internet intermediaries, for those of us especially working in Global South context, what have been some of the challenges? Thank you so much. Hi everyone, good morning. How are we doing? Yeah, Friday morning. All right, thank you so much for having me join this panel. Um, I want to bring the African perspective while fully understanding Africa is not a country, it's many different countries put together. But of course it does get linked as one because they do tend to have similar laws which are often copy pasted. So for this purpose, a lot of the laws are similar. But first of all, I wanted to start out with some research that we're doing under the Feminist Internet Research Network under APC, and this is a five country research project across Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're trying to understand what is the lived experiences of women online, and particularly related to online gender-based violence. So as part of this, we're doing broad-based quantitative surveys, and we're also doing a lot of qualitative research as well. And related to this topic, what we really found is that 
most women are not aware of any laws which exist to protect them online. So the numbers are somewhere around 80 to 90% have no idea that there are laws to protect them. And then the other 10 to 20%, their stories are that when they do go to the police, they're just laughed at. Um, one of our in-depth interviewees said, the police asked her to show her where, where it hurt on her body. So it was like, show me where it hurts. And so in the first case, you know, in relation to Brazil and India, these cases don't even make it anywhere because the police refuse to file them because they're joke cases, they're not, it's not real life. So that's, we, we're stopped there itself before it can even get into the legal system. So I think that's the first point that I really wanted to make. Um, in terms of Uganda, I think, sometimes I wonder if it's one of the more extreme cases, but it might actually just be the norm. So I'm just going to tell you a, um, a couple of different laws from across the continent. And in Uganda, we have the Computer Misuse Act, which was passed in 2011. And that's the only act which mentions cyber harassment. And under that, you can be tried for hate speech under offensive communication. So that's one of them. In Kenya, they have the, a similar act. I think it's called the Computer and Cyber Law. And they have, as, as we've already heard, there's a lot of vague wording. For example, they use the words indecent and gross, but never explain what that means. And so these laws are really just completely subjective. And purposely so, because a lot of these laws are actually passed to stop dissent and usually to throw your opposition into jail under these vague laws that you know anyone can use. Um, another scarier one that's coming up, this is in Nigeria, and it's broadly called the social media bill or the hate speech bill. And this was actually thrown out of court, and then two weeks ago it again resurfaced. And it's one of the more extreme ones because it's focused on hate speech, but the, the penalty is death or life imprisonment. And again, of course, it's, they, they say it's related to ethnic violence, so if you post content that may have caused the death of someone, then you, in turn, should also you know, face a death penalty. But in all these laws, there's no wording around women. I'm not saying this is a good law, but they've gone to the extent of saying that they're willing to kill someone, but in no way have they brought in a gendered lens. And then there's other countries, um, I think this is Senegal, where the law protects minorities, so minority groups, minority tribes, or minors, and especially minors related to pornographic content. But again, women are totally left out. So women neither would fall under the minority groups and they would neither fall under minors. So when your images are leaked, there's really no laws to protect you. And in, um, th this is even more extreme because here we're talking about laws to protect women, but there are laws being passed to actually punish women. And this is um, particularly uh, a case in Uganda where in 2014, the Anti-Pornography Act was passed. And this was, this was a very contentious time because there was a lot of different laws being passed, such as the Anti-Homosexuality Bill, the Miniskirt Bill, and basically there's this obsession with moral policing um, in the country, and you know, we've already been hearing about the rise in conservatism. So, not only is the law silent on hate speech, but it also punishes women. So, for example, in Uganda, if your images are leaked, you can be arrested and you can be imprisoned because you have affected the morals of the society. So whoever leaked your images goes scot-free. There's, because a lot of the cases that are online, like you can see who did it, like no one's hiding it. Even in one case, the woman published her text messages with the person's name visible and he admitted to doing it and nothing was brought against him, but the lady was fired. Um, she disappeared for six months, she finally resurfaced. And we've seen this multiple times, actually. And in one case, um, there was actually a case of a college student who leaked her own images, and she was actually sent to jail. So in the other cases, they were arrested, but they were never given jail time. And the other interesting laws are around talking about intermediaries, the social media tax also, again, Uganda. And this tax was passed very quickly. The president made a statement on Twitter saying that there's too much gossip online and then within about two months the, the bill went into force, which essentially requires everyone to pay about uh, 200 Ugandan shillings per day to access social media websites. 
And while 200 shillings is about six to eight cents, it's actually a lot of money for people in Uganda. It's, it's very prohibitive. And we've been doing uh, studies on access and how the social media tax affects the population. And women are much more affected because uh, they just can't afford it. Already the data prices are quite high, so to add money on top of that just is another tool for silencing women and keeping them offline. And there's some notable cases that I wanted to bring up. There's one case where, this might be the only case actually, where the cyber harassment law was, has worked in the favor of a woman. And it was a case by a member of parliament uh, called Sylvia Rabugo. And she started to receive um, messages from a young man. And the media framed this as love messages, but of course they were messages of harassment for a year. And when they finally went to court, um, she broke down and started crying about how traumatic this experience was. And this young man just started laughing and just laughed through the whole court proceedings. He did receive two years of jail time. But what's interesting is the response to that as well. Because once the, the verdict was given, then she again became um, a victim of trolling. Because everyone wanted her to apologize for making a big deal of nothing when really she's stopping men from professing their love and you know, just the general patriarchal structures. And, but what's important there is that this was only possible because she was a woman in a position of power. And she was able to bring this case out, but for most people, as I said earlier, this is just not possible. The case would never have reached this extent. And another case is um, that of Dr. Stella Nyanzi, which has been ongoing for the past two years. Um, she, once she approached the first lady because she wanted there to be a program for young girls to receive sanitary napkins for free. And this wasn't done, and so she ended up calling the president a pair of buttocks and said some statements that he should actually have been aborted. And for that, she was charged under the cyber harassment law, and she's actually been in jail for about a year now. So that's another case where it was used. And going back to intermediaries, there's African governments have very little stake in what these platforms do. The most that you're seeing now, as I mentioned, is the social media tax, which again affects Ugandans. It doesn't affect the platform in any way. It's Ugandans who suffer at the hands of these laws. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is these, this use of algorithms to filter content. Because right now, Facebook's moderation has seven African languages, when in total there's about 3,000 African languages. So it's completely out of the question that algorithms or whatever intelligence will be able to filter content in the African context. And the other important thing is also that the community standards of Facebook, for example, are determined by Facebook. They're not really governed by any laws. They're not forced to. And that means that the community standards of the world are based on what Facebook and the US think are morals. And so now these Western morals are being instilled into African economies because in the African context, for example, the breasts are not sexualized. And you know, in some cultures, it's okay to show your breasts. But on Facebook, this would be completely unacceptable and this would be taken down. So I think that there's, there's really this ignoring of the cultural context and very little power from these countries to do anything about it. So I'm really glad that we're having this conversation and I'm really interested to see where it goes in terms of it, you know, the legal framework in protecting women because a lot of these laws are being passed all across the continent to repress women and to repress freedom of expression. So yeah, I would love to chat more about this as well during the discussion. Thank you. And uh, now we turn to our fourth uh, panelist, uh, Christoph Speckbacker, who is part of the team on gender equality at the Council of Europe. And the team is supporting the intergovernmental activities in the field of standard setting, research, awareness raising, and gender mainstreaming in various activities of the organization. Uh, so Christoph will give us the perspective of the Council of Europe on the issue of online sexism and sexist violence, especially in the light of the recent recommendation in 2019 that was issued on preventing and combating sexism. 
And on this, Christoph, I have a very specific question for you. So after hearing all this, and we also see that there is a broad culture of sexism and misogyny. And when we try to draw the line, because everything in sociality we can see as sexist, right? There is general sexist banter, there are sexist jokes. So when we have to legalize and we have to draw the line about at what point does it become criminalized or it becomes sexist hate speech, so from the Council of Europe's guidelines and from your own experience in this area, could you also like reflect on that a little bit? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to be the, the last element on this panel, giving also the European perspective. Uh, and for those who think that everything that has been mentioned before is not something that is of concern to Europe, well, that would be a, a pretty wrong idea because we have exactly the same issues in Europe. It's just that uh, it's a general, generational matters. People realize only nowadays uh, that these uh, problems are, the problems of uh, sexism and stereotyping are deeply entrenched in our European societies as well. Uh, at various levels and affecting different categories of actors, uh, impacting uh, still on the gender pay gaps in Europe. Uh, you won't be surprised maybe to hear that the biggest pay gaps in Europe are observed in the richer countries, Western Europe especially, um, and that we still have not reached uh, a satisfactory balance also of uh, men and women in political institutions. So uh, only very few parliaments have reached the ideal threshold, I'd say, of uh, a minimum of 40% of men or women in parliament. And we're still far from 50% in most of the cases, with a very few exceptions. Um, the Me Too uh, movements uh, over the last few years have uh, shed a new light on uh, the various problems connected with sexism as the one or one of the underlying causes of these persisting inequalities in Europe. And this is why after, let's say, 40 years of work at the level of the Council of Europe uh, in Strasbourg on uh, addressing the gender pay gaps, on promoting women's rights, uh, on combating discrimination at work, on uh, ensuring uh, the proper representation of women in senior positions in the industry, in political institutions, etc. It was decided to address the subject of sexism itself as a self-standing concept. So we moved from the layers of positive rights, uh, as for instance enshrined uh, in the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, prohibits discrimination, including based on uh, uh, on gender, etc., to get progressively into the very roots of these persisting inequalities in Europe. Um, the problem is that so far the, the instruments uh, that we had at the European level and sometimes more globally because some of these instruments that you see on the screen are also open to uh, non-Council of Europe member states, uh, they don't deal really um, uh, with the problem of sexism and sexist hate speech as such. Uh, they are, some of them are obviously the, the prolongation, I would say, of the issue of sexism. If you take, for instance, the, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence from 2011, uh, I mean, the issue of, of sexism is everywhere, and gender equality as well, uh, and gender-specific approaches to, uh, to violence, etc. Um, this is the instrument which, by the way, uh, internationally tries to revert the definition of rape uh, and to introduce the principle of lack of consent. Um, so we are very proud of this instrument. Uh, it also pre prohibits uh, forced genital mutilations, uh, stalking, forced marriage, harassment, but not uh, in the cyberspace as such. Um, the same with the Convention on Cybercrime, so we have a fantastic tool here, uh, and although uh, it covers uh, a number of important uh, things, like uh, the, say, uh, the, the attacks on the internet systems, um, and, and databases, etc., and also uh, via a protocol, uh, it deals with racist and uh, xenophobic uh, hate speech. It does not cover uh, gender-specific uh, and, and sexist uh, hate speech. 
Um, we have also for the European continent uh, another important text, um, which is the EU Code of Conduct on Countering Illegal Hate Speech Online, um, which was negotiated by the European Commission, uh, so in Brussels, with some of the lead players uh, that you, you can see here on the, on the screen. Um, but this text deals uh, with the classical forms of hate speech, uh, like racism, xenophobia, or based on religious considerations, but not uh, those forms of violence which are gender-related or based on, on, on sexism. Um, so for these reasons, and also because of the, uh, the, the, the recent gender backlash we also have in Europe, uh, both in mostly in Central Eastern Europe, but not just. Uh, the phenomenon of neoconservative movements is observed also in other parts. Um, and also uh, because of social, uh, social reactions to the Me Too movement, um, the Council of Europe has decided to work on, on the subject of sexism. I would like to show you here a picture of the kind of things that normally you would think, okay, uh, we wouldn't see that uh, in Europe anymore, but it happens, so write me all day for three pounds. Uh, great, and that's in the open space. Uh, obviously, when you have something like that, that was in the United Kingdom uh, a few years ago, um, around 2012, I think. Obviously, when you have something like that, uh, you have immediately a number of organizations which would uh, jump to the roof, so to say, and which would, would call for the removal of this kind of advertisements. And that's what happened indeed. I think within a week, uh, it was removed. Uh, the company tried to defend itself by saying, well, we've done the, the same with men, also naked men or half-naked men, or men in suggestive, uh, suggestive positions. The fact is that those with men were uh, unfoundable in the city or <laughs> in places which, where there was less traffic or, or less visitors. So now, what does it say us? Uh, we have the same problem with the internet. And what you see right now on the screen is an advertisement, an official advertisement of the Vilnius uh, city. It's uh, a promotional poster uh, done um, in, the context, uh, in the context of uh, touristic attractiveness of the, of the capital city of Lithuania. Um, this uh, has been on the net for quite some time now, um, maybe two years almost. Um, I have not seen or heard any, uh, any reactions asking for the removal of this publicity. Um, so it seems that uh, although we have the same problems in the, in the real life, in the real tangible uh, public spaces uh, and in the internet, uh, apparently the, the, what is in the internet uh, is a particular source of challenges. Um, and we have, of course, um, as another form of, of online uh, violence, that's the most, probably the, the, the most extreme form. Uh, it's these internet communities which are nowadays uh, extremely hostile to women. Um, they have been they are in the process of being researched at the moment. I've taken here uh, an excerpt from the Wikipedia uh, that you all know uh, concerning the definition of the so-called incels, which is the abbreviation for involuntary celibates. And these groups are uh, sometimes um, extremely violent in their communications and in the ideas they propagate. And according to research that, is, uh, that was conducted and that is uh, mentioned on Wikipedia, uh, apparently uh, members of these incel communities were involved uh, in physical attacks and shootings uh, in, uh, on several occasions in, in North America. Um, for those of you who are interested, a little information, the Danish government is now conducting an official research uh, which was commissioned uh, this year uh, to map what they call the, the manosphere. Uh, and this study will be released in the autumn of uh, 2020, so it will be an official research on these various uh, male-dominated uh, hate, uh, hate groups. So, um, the recommendation uh, of the Committee of Ministers on preventing uh, and uh, combating sexism is probably the first international instrument 
it's not a treaty, it's an instrument, uh, so it has a legal value. It's a, it's a recommendation of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe to the Member States, so it can be, uh, it can be used uh, for policy making. Um, it can also be uh, uh, promoted by NGOs uh, when they do advocacy now in the, in the different countries of the Council of Europe. Um, this text pursues a global approach with regard to the problem of, of sexism. Um, it has uh, different, uh, different chapters uh, on the judiciary, on communication, on sports, on the public sector, the private sector, etc. And there's one chapter specifically um, on, on the internet and new communication tools. But what I wanted to say is that uh, the, because of the importance of the internet today, uh, replacing the classical media, as you know, as you all know, we have nowadays online newspapers, we have uh, online advertising spaces. You've seen uh, how uh, the city of Vilnius is using this very well instead of uh, posters on the streets, etc. Um, we have to, to think uh, of the internet also through various angles, including, for instance, uh, through the, the, the perspective of language and communication. So uh, one of the objectives of this, uh, uh, this recommendation of the Council of Europe is to, uh, to address uh, sexism via the promotion of uh, a gender neutral or gender inclusive language. Um, and uh, it calls for the systematic uh, review of uh, all the, the, the legal texts uh, so as to uh, take out uh, any, uh, any um, uh, sexist or stereotypical element. Uh, and I should say, actually, we could start with ourselves at the Council of Europe because I came across uh, several texts uh, recently which are, which are fairly old but which are still regulating the functioning of the organizations and it still refer, refer, uh, refer, these texts still refer, for instance, to the chairman and then the text goes on with he, 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 he. So as if uh, it, were, it was obvious that uh, women were, were not meant to occupy such a position. Uh, and in French, obviously, also on our website, uh, when we refer to the European Court of Human Rights, we, we still say uh, droit de l'homme, so the men's rights, and not les droits humains. Uh, so this is something we have to, to work on ourselves, um, because these little tiny things tend, obviously, to to build this culture of, of stereotypes and, and sexism. Um, as regards the chapter on the specific chapter on the internet, social language and communication that is contained in this recommendation, um, the, the, uh, there is a call to criminalize sexist hate speech uh, and that should apply to all types of media. Um, the text does not provide for a definition of the sexist hate speech. Uh, it leaves it up to the countries, depending on their specific problems in the various regions of Europe, uh, to define how they would uh, how they how they would want to to, uh, to address uh, sexist hate speech uh, and to focus or not on specific areas of or forms of expression. Uh, whether in writing or in pictures, etc., etc., uh, it calls also for the establishment of reporting procedures uh, in order to uh, facilitate the detection uh, of uh, of sexist hate speech and obviously also sanctions. And uh, there is a call also for all the operators to to take proactive uh, proactive measures to to facilitate the detection. Um, you see on this slide um, the various um, measures that uh, the recommendation also calls for. I mean, educational, awareness raising measures, informational measures, uh, conducting campaigns about the, uh, the risk of the sexist misuse of social media. We have now uh, some countries which have launched programs especially uh, targeting the, the young public and young users of the internet. For instance, in Slovenia, they have a project called Click Off. Uh, to uh, not just to inform uh, young women and young boys about the, the risks of uh, certain behaviors on social media or certain websites or platforms, but also to, uh, to address the problem of addiction, apparently, uh, which is connected with the use of the internet. Um, as some of those uh, who are in the room here know and who have done research about the, uh, the use of the internet, many people uh, on the platforms and on, uh, on, on the networks, they tend to use it sometimes to create 
um, their personality or sometimes another personality. Um, the, the internet has really become um, a kind of mirroring uh, place for, 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 for humans and their uh, either the, the, the person they are or the person they would love to be or the, the person they want to tell the world that, uh, the, to the world that they, uh, that, that they, that they are, although sometimes um, it's, uh, it's based on, uh, um, how, would, how would I say, Ima imaginative stories and information, etc. So there's a, there's a kind of, of lyrics around all that. Um, there's obviously also in this recommendation a chapter uh, on media advertising and other communication services. So the idea is to ban sexism uh, in the various forms of media and advertisement. Um, interestingly, there's a call also to review the defamation laws so that uh, um, the countries would include uh, the elements of sexism uh, in defamation laws because this is probably one of the classical tools uh, that could be best used um, to also deal with sexist, uh, sexist hate and sexist content. Um, obviously, the dialogue with the industry is uh, is very important. Um, the model that uh, that the, the drafters of the recommendation had in mind was to to develop uh, was for the industry to develop themselves internal programs. Um, to uh, to deal with the uh, the, the reporting uh, or disclosure of uh, uh, illegal or provocative or harmful content, etc., uh, along the the, the rules um, the rules of conduct that the that the EU has established, for instance. Um, but obviously, uh, since all the, the the media operators are not just global. Uh, it's also for each country to, to, to provide for, for, for rules and regulations which could support the developments of, of such internal programs. As you know, they already exist in various fields like uh, um, dealing with internal fraud or de dealing with internal discrimination and so on. Um, we, we count a lot also, obviously, on the awareness of, of journalism, uh, uh, journalists and the media communication uh, communities to contribute to, this, uh, to these efforts and also of re researchers. Um, in relation with uh, um, the, um, the depiction of uh, and of, of women at the moment, uh, uh, an increasing issue is um, uh, is connected with the the, the, the pornographic industry. Uh, the internet allows um, a number of new phenomena, I would say, like youngsters selling images of themselves to make money uh, via pornographic platforms. Um, the New technologies also allow um, to um, uh, make people look, young, look younger. Um, and um, the problem is that the, the, the pornographic industry is powerful enough uh, to lobby sometimes the governments. I'm thinking especially of the US because there was, a, um, there was a, an evolution in the case law in the US. Um, uh, to, to, to facilitate the continuation of these, uh, uh, of these pornographic contents. Um, and according to research that was conducted in, in Hungary, for instance, um, the, the, the most highly rated uh, pornographic uh, movies are often movies which are extremely violent. Um, so these are worrying trends, I would say. So to sum up um, quickly, uh, we obviously need a more gender sensitive approach as regards all our uh, policies that we have in place uh, in order to be able to, to deal with these new forms of online sexist violence. Um, the, the initiatives that have already been taken in a few member states, if, if we sum it up, uh, as the recommendation of 2019 uh, did it this year, uh, we need complementary actions in various fields, education, awareness raising, uh, criminal enforcement, obviously, uh, multi-stakeholder approaches uh, involving also the, uh, the industry and NGOs in case uh, they are given the, the possibility to, to file lawsuits uh, in, the, in the common interest. Uh, we need rapid reaction mechanisms, obviously. 
Uh, we will also need uh, new offenses, certainly. Uh, sexist hate speech is one. Um, probably also online stalking or online harassment, online, uh, online doxing, uh, which is the accumulation of information about, uh, about persons. It's a form of harassment, actually. Um, as regards the criminal response, we have noted from uh, several countries which have started to, to criminalize these new uh, phenomena, um, we have uh, noted a kind of over-reliance on the criminal law response. The problem, as you mo many of you will know, is that the criminal justice system is slow in, in terms of response. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, to have proceedings which last for three to five years. Uh, so the, the criminal law response should not be the only only uh, avenue available in case you need to remove, uh, for instance, illegal content. Um, that's why the dialogue and other soft law mechanisms with the industry are equally important. And let's not forget that when we are dealing with global platforms, uh, we may well be confronted with platforms which are hosted uh, or operated by companies uh, in one country where the victim or groups of victims would be in another country and uh, obviously uh, uh, the persons using these platforms would be in a, th in, in a third country. So all these are challenges, to, uh, challenges to, to, to bear in mind for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, I would now like to open up the floor for comments and questions. So if you have a comment or a question, if you could put up your hand, then I could just come around and pass the mic. Okay, first you and then, okay. Um, hi, thank you, that was really interesting. Uh, my name's Maria Vlahakis, I work for a global women's rights organization um, based in the UK. And I'll keep it really short, I know we're pushed for time. Um, but as some of the panelists know, we've done quite similar, supported some similar research in Kenya, um, Zimbabwe and Nepal, and all the findings that you've shared from Uganda, Brazil and India um, mirror exactly kind of what came out of our small scale study. Um, my question actually is what the panelists think might need to happen internationally, because I think despite there being global, increasing global commitments, such as by the G7, the G20, and increasing regional initiatives, and Christoph has highlighted some of those, um, there still doesn't seem to be international action, which would really drive um, and ensure that this is enshrined in national laws and policies. And the two areas that come to mind for me, from our research, was around definition, um, the lack of a, a global definition does present challenges in measuring and documenting these experiences and having comparisons. I know there are issues with defining, particularly it's, it's contentious, particularly those that want to use definitions to restrict freedom of expression, but in some, some sort of global move to have some sort of definition, whether you think that could be useful, and also in terms of data collection, because obviously data collection is done, isn't really done at the regional and global level. So again, makes measurement and comparisons and documentation quite difficult. First, thanks for all the intersectionality, because uh, I think it's really important. Fe having a feminist analysis and an intersectional feminist analysis bringing a lot uh, of clarity, and I think that can help anyone, so thanks. And thanks also for the very concrete examples. Just wanted to say one thing around pornography because I think that can derange the conversation. We know that there are porn sites that have very, very well developed uh, content models, uh, content management models really with their participant. And I think that is bringing out outside of this conversation because uh, adult uh, uh, content and consensual adult content. So I would like just to be aware that we, we need to be very, very careful because then we completely dismiss the feminist analysis, the intersectionality that has been brought here as a way to identify a sexist age speech. And we go back to a very typical, I would say, Western and white and a specific kind also, if you want, feminist discourse that can really make them vanishing all the nuances that you have brought in the conversation. Hello, hi, I'm Deborah from Italy and I'm a trainer in human rights education and I'm an activist against hate speech. So um, when hearing you, uh, my concern is um, 
when you talk think about awareness of women, especially young women, um, I uh, meet a lot of uh, problems when talking with especially teenagers, because I come from a country that recently is got really going back when it comes to controlling bodies and, you know, what women, how women should act and things like that is really worrying. But uh, I won't uh, take too much time in taking the example, but my question is, how can we address the problem of the patriarchy with so much interiorized within young women that, you know, they think that being feminist or like fighting for women's rights means being annoying. So uh, to the point that, you know, if men are acting violently and rate of violence against women and um, killing of women are raising it because women are taking too much, they are repressing men by raising their voice. I mean, this is a really, really worrying pattern we are seeing that, you know, when trying to educate women is like, you know, if I speak up, I'm annoying, so I make men in a difficult position. So how can we address this? Because it's like we are interiorizing pat patriarchy and you know, this system of oppression so much that we actually, uh, we have more women sometimes, the women that can be more sexist than men, uh, because you know, we have so much victim of this system. So um, how would you address this problem? Because it's one of my biggest struggle. Katarina uh, from the Association for Progressive Communication. Uh, I also want to thank you for a very interesting panel. And I have two questions. One question is in particular to the Council of Europe. And I'm, I would like to know how Council of Europe want to review laws and policy and develop gender sensitive terminology in the context of some uh, members of the European Union which experienced backlash against the gender as the concept itself like in the case of Bulgaria, which uh, ruled out gender as unconstitutional. And in relation to that question, I also have a question to all uh, speakers, how we can make sure that legal frameworks is protecting the right to freedom of expression and association of LGBTIQ community. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the, the thoughts and all the, the things that are happening in, uh, in India and uh, Africa and different uh, countries. Uh, I'm Vladimir Cortez uh, from Article 19 from the Office of Mexico and, and Central America. And uh, I have like uh, two questions, maybe some of them they are related uh, to some of the things that uh, are, have already mentioned here. But uh, the first one, it's like, what do you think of the, uh, whoever wants to, to take it, of the punitive uh, perspective to tackle online violence? Uh, we actually now in Mexico are having uh, a big discussion with uh, different laws which would uh, want to uh, change uh, penal codes for uh, tackling or facing uh, non-consensual distribution of sexual images. But the things that we are like seeing, it's like in a context of uh, like uh, uh, overwhelming impunity of 99% in which we have also uh, journalists being killed, which uh, they're not having like any access to justice or women who are facing femicides in Mexico. How does like this, uh, punitive perspective of uh, tackling uh, violence, which work. And then I will jump to the second question. Uh, how, how do we like, balance uh, this perspective of, of hate speech and online violence with, uh, with freedom of expression? And uh, just a very quickly third, how you are defining hate speech? Because what we are seeing also in, in Mexico and different countries in the region in Latin America is that states are using the idea of hate speech to censor uh, legitimate uh, speech, legitimate expressions, and to uh, those uh, dissenting uh, voices. Thank you very much. Hi, we have a question from the online participants. Uh, it's from Sonak Sonaksha, an independent illustrator from India, graphic, who is graphically recording the session. 
And the question is, reflecting on a previous session at IGF and raising his meter from point of view's point, it's also really important we don't implicitly create a, a, a hierarchy while not including trans, non-binary, and gender diverse people into the discourse. How inclusive are the measures we are taking and fighting for? And since the terminology we are using is still largely looks at gender through a binary lens. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Now we have uh, 10 minutes. So I request all the panelists to give like a two minute quick response to the part of the questions each of you would like to respond. And we can start with uh, Christoph. Um, yes, thank you for the, the questions. Um, how to address patriarchy um, that, you, that you have seen in Italy. I think uh, we, if you look at the recommendation from 2019, it requires action at, at different levels. So the idea is really to change cultures uh, and uh, stereotypes, um, the, the perception of women and men's roles, etc. So inevitably, you will require action at different levels. Um, and obviously, I think if we are speaking of the patriarchal model as such, i.e. this overwhelming position of men, I think it is time to also involve men uh, themselves in those policies. They shouldn't be seen as just uh, a policy for, f by the women for the women. Uh, I know that some countries are now trying uh, to use sponsors uh, from, you know, like uh, celebrities from the cinema sector uh, to, uh, to convey and to support these new, uh, these new um, messages addressing men specifically or also sports trainers in the locker rooms uh, when they talk to the, to the young boys, um, etc. Um, we have also men nowadays who, who start to use another discussion in the, in the promotion of these gender equality uh, policies by saying that, uh, well, every man has at least one woman in his, or in his life, a mother, a sister, uh, a daughter, etc. So it's, it's also men's world, uh, men's, men's business. Uh, so probably that's the kind of uh, focus that could be developed. Um, how will the Council of Europe review the situation of gender backlash uh, in certain countries? You've mentioned Bulgaria. Um, the, the, when it comes to this uh, instrument, the recommendation of 2019 adopted this year, uh, countries will have two to three years now to implement it. Uh, and then we will start a review process to see how it is uh, actually implemented uh, in the in the member states, and I get I guess we will have more and more information by by then, uh, and be able to exert uh, progressively a pressure on on the countries. Um, how to tackle? Um, that was the, the the question from the gentleman from from Mexico. Uh, what would make the justice system work uh, b work better uh, with regard to some of these? Uh, um, criminal offences we are, we are talking about. Um, I think it is important nowadays as part of these uh, equality policies um, to also draw all the consequences from the, the concept of ma gender mainstreaming, uh, which means that uh, policy makers, i.e. government, parliament, should nowadays include uh, the gender uh, dimension in all aspects of policy making. And, and in all institutions of, uh, of the state, and that includes the judiciary uh, and training, uh, for instance, uh, the judges, the prosecutors, but also within the police system, training the people on these gender, gender issues is absolutely uh, crucial. And we've seen how progressively uh, there are now some improvements. Uh, there are certain questions which are taboo if a woman has been raped and now goes to the police. Uh, I mean, there are certain questions you don't ask, like uh, what were you doing that evening uh, at, uh, so late outside uh, on your own? Or uh, what were you dressing exactly? So these are questions which should definitely be taboo. So it's a matter of education also in the, in the state institutions. Uh, Nima. <laughs> uh, right, I think a lot of the questions that people ask are really good questions. and. I would also love the answers to those questions. Um, across Africa, a lot of these hate speech laws are being passed to gag freedom of expression. 
Um, they're just hidden under different names, but of course that is the overall purpose of them. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of civil society is struggling with how to how to reverse some of the actions of this, but it also feels like we're being bulldozed by these laws and, and there's very little we can do about it. And I do agree with the comment that it is very important to have definitions and I wonder if having those definitions will make it easier for us to go after these laws and to strike them down. Because across the continent, as I said, a lot of the cybercrime laws are copy-pasted from one to the other from some overall document. So I wonder if we start with one, if then we can push other countries as well to adopt similar laws. Um, and yes, also it's true that there is not um, international application of these laws. Laws that are passed in one country, if there's a law in Uganda, it can't be used to try someone in Kenya. We just don't have the processes for that to happen. So I think that's also a very important discussion. Um, to the person that said that feminists are annoying, yeah, but it's, um, in Uganda, I actually feel like I have seen a positive development online, maybe not in physical spaces, but I definitely feel over the past five years, because of the noise that feminists have been making, I do feel like the conversation has changed and, and men and women are more careful about what they say online. So I think we just have to keep being annoying. Uh, thanks uh, for your questions. They were really, uh, really thought-provoking. Uh, so um, on the issue of, uh, uh, you know, what sort of uh, awareness we should have, I think the, the only response to uh, a diminishing space for feminist, uh, for, or claims of feminism uh, is counter-speech, conversation, dialogue. We have to keep talking and engaging with uh, with young women and, um, and young men and, uh, you know, everybody of all hues, um, and ensure that we don't lose uh, grounds that we have gained over the course of our movement. Um, as uh, we, as far as how, uh, how should we address the, can we, can we get together as an international community? I think definitely we should consider coming up with some broader um, categories definitionally, and then we can use those in order to contextualize uh, to our local specific, uh, you know, uh, cultural contexts, and uh, uh, and that might be a that might be a great step going forward. Since, as Mariana pointed out, naming and pointing out what is misogyny uh, are all proving to be difficult uh, struggles for every uh, everyone around the world. Um, as uh, far as um, our friend uh, uh, who asked about uh, what do we do about the freedom of expression and association of the LGBTQ community and uh, also the remote question, um, in the Indian context, we've had uh, Nalsa judgment and Puttaswami and uh, Navjot uh, cases which have read in uh, trans identities within the definitions of sex and gender with, within the constitution. So uh, constitutionally, there is clearly an expanding scope for protections in that sense, uh, and there's a recognition of, of, uh, of uh, all other gender identities. Um, how do we bring that, uh, how do we uh, respond to hate speech within the LGBTQ community is something that I think we have to uh, reflect further on. I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, uh, and uh, on the question of, uh, from my friend from Article 19, uh, on uh, how do we balance hate speech and online violence um, uh, and the freedom of, with the freedom of speech and expression, I think it is uh, important to recognize that uh, in, it is uh, implicit within the idea of freedom of speech and expression that we provide substantive freedom of speech and expression. And that cannot exist if we don't create safe spaces and create an uh, atmosphere of, of, of safety for people when they communicate, uh, whether it is in the real or uh, online uh, spaces. Thank you. And uh, Mariana, since uh, you had like the last panelist to come, and uh, I also want to take the liberty of asking you to comment on the issue that has come up on when we talk about protection from hate speech, it can easily lapse into a patriarchal protectionism, right? Like a benevolent protectionism. So how do we draw the line? Can you also reflect a bit on that? Thank you, Nandini, and also all the questions were really interesting. I think we could discuss them forever. Um, I'll get to that. Uh, I'll, I'll also like to say that um, when we're speaking of uh, uh, the adequateness of punitive frameworks, right, this is something we've been struggling with for a while. 
uh, I think around uh, women's protection and issues around gender in general, um, and not just online, right? Especially because um, in, I think in all countries, but I certainly say from the standpoint of Brazil, when we're speaking uh, in an intersectional, from an intersectional perspective, we know that punitive, uh, punitive solutions, they usually will punish certain bodies and not other bodies. And this is something that we always have to take into consideration when considering uh, the punitive strategy, right? I, I don't think it's an easy question. Uh, we've never been able to come up with uh, definite answers on that. In the past, we did research on unconsensual intimate images as well, and that was always like the hardest question. Should we have a specific criminal offense for that? And uh, that always leads to like uh, eternal uh, discussions. But I think you bring also another interesting point, which others bring uh, in different ways as well, which refers to the freedom of expression uh, uh, perspective. And I also agree that uh, even the hate speech discourse, it's being weaponized in these very weaponized public spheres, let's say. Uh, we've been seeing uh, in many different countries uh, the idea of hate speech being used to curtail dissent, uh, of course. But at the same time, one thing that I'd like to bring up uh, is that this is usually how we frame this within this community. But our research on other topics has also been showing that this is not, not necessarily the way it's framed in the judiciary. So we don't have enough results uh, to speak about this in the, in the case of sexism. Um, but we do have previous research from people in our team about racism in the judiciary. And that was also a question that was brought up uh, when we're speaking of racist lawyers, for example. Is freedom of expression going to be an issue or is it going to be even discussed? And what we found out in the Brazilian courts is that usually this issue doesn't even come up because the difficulty is in having a judge recognize that something is racist. Uh, it's like a level before. It's not that you have a judge discussing, um, okay, this is racist, but there's an issue of freedom of expression. No, there's even a difficulty in saying this is racist. So just to say that, of course, I think that has to be in mind all the time, but sometimes we overstate uh, how this discussion is being made and we're having even difficulties in, in defining that something is racist or that something is sexist. I don't know if I made myself clear. Um, and then there's the question on um, feminists being annoying, right, and all that discourse. And I think there's an interesting discussion to that because I completely agree with Nima that we shouldn't stop being annoying and we shouldn't lower uh, the level of the radicality of the discourse on feminism, of course. But at the same time, there is some thought to be made on how to, um, I don't know, revamp strategies sometimes, right? When certain terms become too weaponized, what do you do? Do you insist on them or do you come up with other terms? And that was something that I read recently. It was an interview from Patricia Hill Collins and she was asked exactly the same question. What to do when uh, the very talk around feminism has been so weaponized and she was answering, well, we, we need to get to the values, right? If we need to like come up with new words uh, uh, to, to reach that, that's also fine. Uh, and that does not mean lowering the, the level of radicality, right? It's, it means uh, how do we reach people uh, through different kinds of discourse. And then uh, Nandini was asking me uh, about this whole issue of freedom of expression for men and for women. And this is something that's been coming up both in the, the research but also all the other discussions that we've been making, right? And I think what she means is that um, we've constantly seen the whole freedom of expression uh, discussion being framed around men's freedom of expression, and this is what uh, we've been finding in all these court rulings, right? Men being uh, uh, being able like to to bring their freedom of expression issues, and how 
um, it's it's like privacy, right? It's like all these rights that always have been thought of as being uh, rights of men. So we have the same discussion regarding privacy. How do we discuss privacy and feminism in a context in which women have fought so long to publicity, right? To be in the public sphere, not to be in the private sphere. But if you really look at that, it wasn't a privacy right that women had, right? It was a privacy right that men had uh, regarding uh, patriarchy, right? That made women have to stay private. So I think it's the same discussion that we have to approach, like what is a freedom of expression approach that is really feminist, that really addresses women. So this is, this is like a lot of discussions. So, and just to address the online questions, which I think is really important, I don't think we have actually addressed that pro uh, sufficiently in this panel. And I think that uh, this is something that we should uh, always take into consideration in these discussions, transgender people, non-binary people, and just a quick comment on that. Our laws are far from being able to uh, address that properly or even to recognize that. And I think that's also something that this discussion must bring. Um. <laughs> so thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think we are out of time and we are done. <laughs>